really tell, you know, like, and <coughs> again, she primed my expectations to see my cat. Um, and this was kind of like a complete emotional roller coaster, right? And in retrospect, it's all entirely explicable. But there's still this kind of feeling of inexplicableness there. That, as entertaining as I can make the story, no one can quite get a grip on. Right? And one of the things that religion does is to give us ways of dealing with and trying to understand and live with and maybe try and talk about experiences <coughs> like this. Everybody has moments in their lives that are coincidental and filled with kind of weird purpose that was unexpected, right? Religion is the set of tools that humans use to make sense of these things. So, today, this is what we're going to talk about. Right. So, as ever, we begin with questions and methodology. Um, and today, so if you remember the different philosophical sub-disciplines I talked about in the first lecture, today we're in the domain of epistemology and logic and philosophy of language. Right? Our questions are... What can and can't be thought? Right? And on the other hand, what can and can't be said? So we are talking about the relationship between thought and language, which is one of the perennial philosophical problems that runs across the entire tradition, right? And so today, for theology, I'm going to be talking about pseudo-Dionysus and negative theology. But if I have time at the end, I'll talk about Ludwig, Ludwig, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, who is famous as a figure in the 20th century who talks about these kinds of things. So, let's break down these two questions. What can be thought? What can be said? So, what do we mean by thought and said? So, here's a couple different things we could mean by thought. Right? We could talk about experience. Right? What, I, what I described to you earlier it was an experience. Right? So that's the kind of thing I had, and it, it sort of object was what you might think of as feeling. Right? Right? That's the thing that <coughs> having difficulty describing. Right? Uh, we might also talk about understanding. Right. And I'd say this is an attitude whose object is meaning. Right. So, you know, when we talk about a piece of poetry or otherwise a piece of art, often what we're trying to do is to understand the meaning of it, the content. Right. Regardless of whether we think it's any good or not, or whether we think it's true, we can understand it. Then we might talk about knowledge. Whose object is truth. And we've already talked about this a bit. Right. So, here we would talk about what can and can't be known. Right. Not simply what can and can't be thought. Because we might think there might be some things that can be thought or experienced, but not known. Right. Okay. And to go a little bit further, we might also talk about justification. Whose object is reasons. Or grounds. Or I was talking about last week. So as we pull these things apart, <coughs> we start to see that the question can be, you know, are there feelings you can't express? Is there understanding, is there meaning that can't be translated? Is there truth 
that cannot be justified. Right? Like knowledge, knowledge that we just we know is true, but we can't provide reasons for. You know, so like for instance, many people will say, look, it's just a moral truth that I shouldn't kill another human being. And you ask them why, and they go, I'm not quite sure, I just think this is bedrock. Like, this is where I hit rock and my spear will just hurt me. Right? In philosophy, we tend to pursue this quite a bit, but there is a legitimate question as to how far we can go with it. Right? At what point do we just have to sort of say, just got to have faith or commitment to what I think is true. Okay. All important questions. How about we break down what can and can't be said? So the f term I've already used is description. You know, I've been saying, well, there seem to be certain <coughs> experiences that I just can't easily describe, right? But the other thing that I have discussed so far in the course is questions, right? Questions are meaningful. In fact, this is what we're talking about now. We're breaking them down. We're trying to understand what they mean, right? And we might say that there are certain questions for which there are no answers, even if they're meaningful. This is what I was saying about Heidegger last week. Heidegger will say the question, why is there something rather than nothing, is not a question for which there is an answer. But this does not mean it is not important. Right? Uh, so, questions sort of correspond to problems, and descriptions seem to correspond to answers and solutions. Um, so that's sort of, is a bit self-reflexive, it, it says something about what we've been doing so far and indeed what I'm doing right now. But there are other ways of talking about language, because these are not the only kinds of what we might call speech acts, right? You know, I can assert that something is true. Right, I can answer a question, I can ask a question. These are the kinds of acts you can do with language. But I can also do other things, like uh, an example that gets used a lot is performatives. Right? So a performative utterance is something like, you know, I name this ship the Steve, or whatever you call it. <coughs> right? That's not a description, that's something that you're doing, you're making the name right, a certain way. Right. Similarly, we can talk about imperatives, right? commands. Right. When I tell you to shut the door, I'm not describing anything. I'm telling you to bring about a certain state of affairs. I'm telling you to make something true, not to take something true. Right. And there's a whole realm of study of these things, which is generally called pragmatics. It's very interesting. However, we might also want to talk about texts. Right? Our speech acts are quite little little chunks of things, but like texts are any kind of larger set of writing which might contain a whole bunch of these different kinds of acts, like say rhetorical questions, for instance. Right? That have more complex communicative <coughs> effects. So when it comes to texts, we start thinking about sort of different types of writing which does do different types of things. So for instance, poetry, right? Or <coughs> metaphor. Uh, or allegory. Right? I mean, I'm kind of running a few different things together here because metaphor and allegory are generally things that are used in poetry. Whereas you might contrast poetry to prose or something like this. Um, what I'm trying to get across is that there's actually a lot of different ways of talking about language and communication. And so when we break down these different types of things we want to communicate, the question, in what ways can they be communicated, 
can actually itself have a lot of variety. Some people might say there are certain thoughts that can be only communicated in poetry. Right? And other people will say, if you cannot describe, if it's not an answer to a question, it's not saying anything. Right? This is the range of debate we've got here. Um, two more thoughts in the methodological bit, and then I'll move on to talking about the actual stuff. First of all, what we're talking about here is limits. Right? When we're talking about what can and can't, right, we're talking about a limit between what can and can't. Right? Whatever, whether we're talking about a limit of thought or a limit of language or whatever, this is what we're talking about. Um, and interestingly enough, these limits are about the limits between something and its negation, when we say the limit between P and not P, <coughs> however you want to think about that. Right. It's something and it's opposite. <coughs> What's the boundary between them? The other thing I want to just briefly note, because this is what we're talking about, is that when we do apply these questions specifically to the philosophy of religion, we get questions like, what are religious speech acts. Oh. Or texts. Right? Religion has always used language in very creative and interesting ways. And understanding what religion is, is often about understanding language. Understanding, for instance, what a holy text is and how it works. Or, you know, we're talking about performatives, right? When the priest says, I christen thee, right? You know, I baptize thee in the name of, right? The specific performatives attached to religion, right? Crucially, what we're interested in today is is more the textual <coughs> right? is is how people engage with religious texts because I've been seeing that sort of so far what theology is about is kind of trying to take doctrine and that means the religious texts in which a particular set of religious ideas are expressed and particular religious practices are, uh, are prescribed taking those texts and trying to read them in a way that makes them consistent. Right. And this is what we call hermeneutics. It's like the science of interpretation. Um, yeah. Oh, briefly, I have two more examples. So, uh, okay, just a couple quick final examples of kinds of religious language. Uh, so, in Christianity, like a really key form of communication coming down from Jesus is the parable. Right? That's the main sort of unit of teaching as far as Christ is concerned. Right? But if we look at other religions, we get different things. So, We've already talked a lot about Greek myth, right? <coughs> certain kinds of narratives in which certain sets of ideas are encapsulated and communicated. But we could also talk <coughs> about Zen coins, right? You know, what is the sound of one hand clapping, right? That's supposed to be a question for which there is no answer. Coins, the whole point is, here is something to consider and think about for which you cannot find a solution. And in that process, achieve some kind of enlightenment, however small. Right, so that's our methodology section. Let's move on to history. So uh, I didn't say much historical last week, and I feel a bit guilty for that. So I'm going to give you some other kind of strange uh, religious background. 
So I said in my first lecture that Christianity has to sort of define itself uh, in relation to other religions that are around at the time that it emerges. Right? Um, so crucially within Judaism, there is a representational taboo regarding God. So what's this? This is this is one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not make graven images. Right? Do not try to represent God pictorially. Right? And that is incredibly influential on the entire tradition of Jewish thought. So what we're going to talk about today in terms of negative theology is, is often very tied to uh, Jewish theology and this kind of need to present God without representing. Sometimes this gets a negative presentation. But in the Greek and Roman context, one other thing to think about is what are called mystery cults. And these are kind of like secret societies that are theoretically open to everyone, right? But where you have to be initiated, right? And you only learn about the secrets and the practices and the beliefs through being initiated. Um, uh, now, another way of, of, of thinking about this is that um, well, we've got two different ways of talking about mystery here, right? From the Judaic perspective, it's mystery in terms, in the sense of being unrepresentable, right? Things that are kind of ineffable. In the Greek and Roman case, it's secrecy in the literal sense of, like, we've got secrets, right? And you're not allowed to know them unless um, <laughs> you do the proper rituals and you join the group, right? Uh, the reason this is important is that there is a particular Neoplatonist, so we've only talked about Plotinus so far, but the, the other main uh, and most influential Neoplatonist after P Plotinus is a guy called Proclus. And Proclus was actually head of the academy <coughs> in Athens. You know, he's literally a kind of successor to Plato at the institution <coughs> Plato thought formed. Um, and Proclus um, wrote a book called The Elements of Theology. So Proclus was very clearly religious, right? Very explicitly a theologian and viewed Plato's dialogues as religious texts. And he tried to present what he thought was the consistent reading of Plato in just the way that certain modern Christian thinkers try and present a consistent reading of Jesus. Right? Um, and, crucially, Proclus was really into mystery cults. Right? Um, and indeed, the way in which he the way in which he develops Plato kind of reflects this, because what Proclus is really interested in doing is recovering the kind of multiplicity of gods in Greek tradition, right? <laughs> the multiplicity of gods, so kind of dealing with this problem of unity and multiplicity, right? <coughs> in a way that doesn't erase the sort of thing that the, the mystery cults are interested in, which is like, you're pledging your life to Athena and getting the secret wisdom. Right. And so, uh, what Proclus does is to kind of complicate that story Plotinus gave. We have, you know, we've got this, this hierarchy of the one, which gets projected down through various layers, right? And what what Proclus does is to say that there are, just to know, in, in Greek, this is hen, right? 
uh, he talks about there being kinads, right? And these are like lower forms of unity, right? That themselves kind of project down and are related between one another. And they're, they're the gods, right? Like, like, in a certain important sense, like, you know, justice does come from Zeus, right? You know, beauty comes from Aphrodite because these are sort of different aspects of the same unified one, the underlying principle. Um, the other thing is that Proclus is very keen on talking about not simply the way in which the one emanates into the things of the world as we know it, but talking about how we return to it, how we are expressions of the divine, but actually through knowledge we can return to the divine. And this is the movement of the soul as far as he's concerned. <coughs> right. So he, he thinks of this as having sort of three stages. <coughs> There's, uh, what is it? Uh, the remaining, remaining uh, procession and then return. So the ideas remain with the one, right? But what proceeds down is the rest of reality, which is more than mere idea, soul and matter. Right? And the return is our souls returning to the ideas. Right? It's a very sort of theological way of working out Plato. Now, the person that we're supposed to be talking about is Pseudo-Dionysus, the Areopagite. <coughs> and to give you a hint for why Pseudo-Dionysus was so influenced by Proclus, right? you know, I've talked about the Trinity as being like the underlying difficult concept in early Christianity that people had to make sense of. Uh, what's that about? That's about this unity multiplicity issue as applied to God. Like Christians think the God is threefold, right? And so having some way of thinking about this relationship between unity and multiplicity when it comes to the divine is quite important, right? Um, also, this idea of return gives you a really important way of thinking about these epistemological questions about what religious knowledge is. Right? This is actually an epistemology. And if you want to be even more suggestive, you say, what remains, that's the Father. What proceeds, that's the Son. And what returns, that's the Holy Spirit. Right? This is a framework that someone who is trying to work out the essence of Christian theology could borrow and use to think about these sorts of questions. So, right, let's actually talk about pseudo-Dionysus. Um, so let me give you just a little bit more history, and then we'll start talking about the, the, the kind of real issues. So uh, the important thing to know about pseudo-Dionysus, well, there's, there's a couple things. Um, one is uh, he sort of immediately succeeds Augustine. So, like, historically, uh, as a historical figure, and I say he, it could have been a woman, I have no idea, right? Uh, uh, about, uh, what is it, it's sort of like 5th, 6th century. Right, late 5th, early 6th. I think I've got that right. Uh, ah, never mind. Anyway, it's immediately after all this. Um... <coughs> The other important thing to know is that it's not just a historical figure, but is in a certain important sense a literary figure. And what do I mean by that? Well, one of the reasons that Pseudo-Dionysus became so popular 
is that Pseudodionysus is a pseudonym. Well, Dionysus is a pseudonym. This is why we call him Pseudodionysus. Like, basically, he picked a character from the Gospels called Dionysus and said, I'm that person. I was there. Allow me to tell you. Right, so for a long time, people thought this was actually a biblical character <laughs> elaborating their wisdom. Right? Um, so already we have interesting literary and linguistic things being involved here. Now, the other thing I just want to say before I get into his actual views is just to talk briefly about his influence. And I've said, I've, talk, I've, I've, I've mentioned negative theology, though I haven't quite explained it yet. But like more, pretty much all of negative theology sort of comes out of pseudo-dionysis. And crucially, this has a, a bunch of different ways it goes. One is that pseudo-dionysis is way more influential in the Eastern <coughs> Church than in the Western Church. So these are the two halves of the Roman Empire that split, and you get two churches, like Greek, Greek Orthodoxy, for instance. And in particular, through another figure called Maximus the Confessor, who was a guy who was literally tortured for his view on the Trinity. On the Trinity. Um, and he, but his view on the Trinity, he developed on the basis of certain ideas from Pseudo-Dionysus. Right? Um, but he's also influential on a figure called Meister Eckhart, who was a, basically a German monk who uh, he was basically given the task of teaching theology to nuns who couldn't read. Uh, and obviously they couldn't read Latin, or couldn't speak Latin, so he had to explain everything to them in German. And uh, so he invented a lot of the German conceptual language that is used in German philosophy. Uh, and this is why a lot of this language is, in a certain <coughs> sense, mystical. Right? This is one of the important figures in mysticism. That's uh, 13th, 14th century. And finally, there's a very influential book called The Cloud of Unknowing. Right. This author is entirely unknown from the late 14th century that again develops out of it. So what we're kind of talking about here is, I mean, I'll, I'll raise that. What we're talking about here in general is what you might call the Christian tr Christian mysticism. This is a, a tradition within Christianity, right? And it influences just mysticism in general, right? All kinds of other sorts of mysticism, including like, like Alistair Crowley in <coughs> the 20th century all very influenced by this sort. <coughs> okay, right. That's the history bit. Done. <coughs> what does Pseudo-Dionysus actually think? Um, <coughs> well, let's go back to Plato one more time. I need to get one of those spray bottles of cleaner. <coughs> okay, here we are. What is what is sitting around this thing? Well, let's go back to Plato. All right, and Plato <laughs> thinks that the good <coughs> is in an important sense the highest idea. <coughs> Why does he think this? Well, there's a variety of reasons you could name. But the most important for our purposes is that it's the idea that makes all the other ideas intelligible. This is the metaphor of the sun in the Republic. The idea is the idea of the good is the sun that spreads light upon everything else, such that it can be seen. And uh, really how this works is that um, 
Plato following Socrates thinks that thinking is a craft. It's something you can do well or do badly. It's a kind of doing, right? <coughs> but that means it's subject to the idea of the good. Right? You can think well or think good, if you like that phrase. Right? This is why the good makes everything intelligent. Right? There's an important sense in which you can think about the other ideas, right? like beauty or like something mathematical, uh, correctly or not. So the good makes things intelligible. Okay, here's something else Plato thinks. The good is not grounded in anything else. Right, there's nothing sitting underneath the good right, from with which the good emerges. There's no deeper reason. Right? either in the sense of cause or in the sense of justification or whatever. Right? Um, and there's some important arguments about this in the Euthyphro, which is where Plato argues about the gods and what piety <laughs> is. So like Socrates will famously ask Euthyphro, like, do the gods tell us to do something because it's pious, or is it pious because the, because the gods tell us to do it? Right? That's the sort of like challenge and the argument's supposed to point out that like any gods who would tell you to do something that wasn't good, right, you probably shouldn't listen to. Right? That the good is good on its own basis, not because of any authority that stands behind it. Right? And that's the basis of saying that the good is is ungrounded. It's yeah, ungrounded is a better word. Ungrounded. Another another word we might use is sweet generous. Right, it's of its own kind. Right. Think of it on its own terms. And what Plato then says is, on the basis of this, that the good is beyond being. Right? Everything else is, right? But the idea of the good, you just can't even talk about it in those terms. So that means that the idea of the good is sort of like a limit. <coughs> it's this edge of intelligibility, right? <coughs> and what Pseudo Dionysus will say following Proclus is that actually this means that the idea of the good is unintelligible. Uh, is unintelligible. <coughs> right. The 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 source of intelligibility is unintelligible. Right. And this is because, in one sense, it's the <coughs> ultimate ground. Right. Right? There's no reasons for it. It is the thing that gives reasons. But also, it's kind of just pure unity. Right? The Neoplatonists are just like, look, the idea of the good's purely simple. You can't say anything about it. Right? To say anything about it would be the kind of say it's got multiple parts. It just doesn't. Right? So this is the sense in which the idea of the good becomes a limit. Right? And this is why Pseudo Dionysus <coughs> talks about divine darkness. <coughs> the only place the light of the sun does not shine is on the sun itself. Right. Super brilliant, super abundant. Darkness. Right. If you've done the reading, you'll know that these are the kinds of sort of paradoxical, contradictory statements that Pseudo Dionysus makes. 
And he makes them because he's trying to talk about this limit. This limit where you only seem to be able to discuss it by saying it's neither this nor that. It kind of is and isn't. <coughs> but also, you know, isn't either. It's a weird way of using language. It's a weird kind of logic. But it's what Pseudo-Dionysus thinks is necessary to be able to talk about the divine. And so he... Uh, I'll switch to a different colour. If, if you can't see this red, let me know. Um, he will talk about two things. The via positiva and the via negativa. So the via positiva is seeing positive things about God. Like, I don't know, uh, he had a son who came down uh, uh, wise. Uh, he's a bit like a dad. <coughs> uh, but he's everyone's dad. Right? This is comparing God to beings, comparing God to things in the world, right? In order to give us some kind of purchase on it. And you know what? This is what the Bible does. Like all these stories in the Bible, they do see a lot of positive things about God, but when it comes to trying to make the Bible consistent, people end up having to go, oh crap, we can't take this literally. If we can't take it literally, how are we supposed to take it? Right. And this is what the via negativa is, in a certain sense, supposed to respond to. It's instead of being about comparison to beings, um, comparison to beings, It's about contrast. We say God is not like this and not like that. Right. <coughs> and one of the ways that Pseudo Dionysus describes this is to say the via negativa is a bit like it's a bit like making a statue. Right. Cutting away chunks of marble and then getting finer and finer in what you're cutting away until you reveal what's beneath. Right. If we keep saying what God isn't, this will give us some kind of purchase on what God is. But it's a purchase that's different from explicitly coming out and saying, well, God's like a guy who has like these features that are like these guys. Right? Because he thinks that that sort of literal language can't be used to describe the divine. Right? Um, and indeed, this is what he thinks his process of return is. Like everything in the world, we can talk about in terms of other things in the world, right? This is being, right? But that which is beyond being, that which is this <laughs> ultimate limit of intelligibility, the only way to turn ourselves back towards it and travel towards it is through negation rather than through po positive. Um, there's a phrase I'd like to, uh, to introduce you here because one of my favourite phrases is some people call this effing the ineffable. Right. But the way to translate that is just to say how do we make the unintelligible intelligible? Right. And if the unintelligible is in fact the ground of the intelligible, Right. To understand the intelligible, we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to make the unintelligible ground of the intelligible intelligible. What an awful sentence is that, right? But that's, that's the paradox. That's what's driving Pseudo Dionysus. Um, so, he does also talk about a way between these two, like the combination of these which I think later on gets called the Via Eminentiae. But we'll talk about that when we get to Aquinas. Uh, the final thing I just want to say is that like, what, what Pseudo-Dionysus is giving us is what we might call an epistemology of unknowing. And this phrase, unknowing, 
is his, and it's what's picked up by everyone after. Right? There's this special kind of knowing, unknowing, right, which is needed to approach the divine. And here's another way of describing this. <coughs> knowing nothing. But again, it's a knowing of nothing in which the nothing is sort of weirdly positive. Right? The nothing is not a mere absence. The nothing is something divine and important. It's the kind of basis from which everything comes. <coughs> is this like the Heidegger's perspective on nothingness as something? Yeah. I mean, again, it's, I'm not saying pseudodionysis is saying the same thing as Heidegger. I'm saying it's actually Heidegger is responding to a deep theological tradition in which this question of, like, can nothing be something more than a mere absence is, is a real issue. Okay, so I think I have 10 minutes or so in which to attempt to talk about Wittgenstein. If anyone's got any final questions about pseudodionysis? Anyone? Uh, I guess he's named after a character in the Bible, and Dionysus probably would have been named after the god Dionysus. Um, there's actually some really interesting stuff with regard to Dionysus and mystery cults. If you're interested, go on, go on to Wikipedia and look up mystery cults. They're fascinating. Right. Um, okay. Anything else? So, the idea is that the good, which is what becomes the one, and then just God in the Christian tradition, right? The good in Plato is the basis of intelligibility. It's the ground of the intelligibility of everything. But the argument is, it is not itself intelligible. Right? The ground of intelligibility as such is unintelligible. So how do we try and approach it? Right? And the idea is there's a kind of different sort of knowledge. There's a different kind of attitude or relationship that we can have to it, which is not the same that we can have to everything else in the world. The divine, as this kind of limit, has to be approached in a completely different way. Right? So... Ludwig Wittgenstein, I won't give you a huge philosophical introduction. Very, very important, uh, the analytic tradition. Um, uh, fraught, weird, interesting human being. Actually spent some time in Newcastle. Um, uh, he also famously has two different periods. He wrote this book uh, <coughs> during the First World War called The Tractatus Logical Philosophicus. I set like a cut down version of that as the reading. And he thought in that book he'd solve all the problems of philosophy. And then went away, tried to teach in school children, found out he was wrong, came back, did something different <laughs> with the same sort of concerns. In both cases he was interested in the limits of language. Right? Um, uh, and interestingly enough, in his second period, he kind of ended up becoming Catholic. Like, actually, you've just got to be Catholic, this is the only way to deal with it. Uh, but what I'm interested in is the early bit, because the early bit is very clearly mystical, right? Very clearly mysticism. So what does Wittgenstein say? Um, I'm running out of space. The key thing that Wittgenstein says is that in order to think a limit, Right? You have to be able to think both sides of it. You've got to be able to think what's on the other side in order to think the limit. Right? And the problem is that when the, this is the limit of thought itself, right, you have to then be able to think the unthinkable in order to think what the limits of thought are. This is the kind of weird paradox which 
is the same thing that uh, Dionysus is getting at, albeit not quite, ex quite as explicitly theological. The, the let's, let's say, thinking both sides. So, how does Wittgenstein try and go about this? Well, he writes this book, Tractatus Logical Phil Philosophicus, in which he's trying to make sense of the limits of thought and language, and it's labelled propositions, right? It's like clear series of deductions between different thoughts. Um, what he's trying to do is to limit what he takes to be the, the, dis the, the limit between sense and nonsense. And there are two other distinctions that are worth thinking about here. One is the distinction between form and content. And then the other distinction that he uses is what we might call the distinction between picturing and showing. So Wittgenstein thinks that the main function of language is description, right? And the way propositions, things that are said, can, can describe the world accurately is because they picture the world. What he means by this is that the form of these propositions actually reflects the structure of the things they talk about. He thinks this is like mirroring between the relationships between the <coughs> words we use and the things in the world we're used to them to talk about. And this is how we, we can talk about truth, right? And crucially, he will say that the world is the totality of facts. For anyone who remembers last week, that's like Augustine's conception of the book of nature. The world is everything that is true. The world is all that is the case. Um, but then what he says is, the limits of my world are the limits of my language. And what does he mean by my world there? Well, this is where he starts sounding more like Heidegger. Heidegger's talking about the world as this feature of my experience rather than as something out there. <coughs> Wittgenstein is again saying something about we all have a world structured by <coughs> the language that enables us to say what is true and what isn't. True. Okay. Here's the next important bit, and I'm not going to quote an actual bit from Wittgenstein, but basically what he says is, there's a distinction between facts and values. And there are no truths, there are no facts about values. He thinks that ethics and aesthetics, right, goodness and beauty, <coughs> have nothing to do with ethics, right? Right, the world, you cannot find in the world what is important in the world. Value is something which is outside of the world, right, as far as you think about truth, right? And interestingly enough, there are a bunch of people inspired by him, particularly the logical positivists, and some people like this, who, who, who start saying things like, ah, well, ethical language and, and aesthetic language is meaningless. It's mean There's no content there because it doesn't have the right form. And that's not what Wittgenstein means. Wittgenstein <coughs> thinks, in fact, these are the most important things to talk about. He thinks the most important things to talk about cannot be described. Right? They can't be pictured. All they can be is shown. 
we have to use language in a different way to show people the things that we take to be important. And this is why he is a mystic, in a sense. It's a kind of mysticism. Now, at the end of the Tractatus, and this is one of the most famous things in 20th century philosophy, he says, those things of which we cannot speak, we must remain silent. <coughs> of those things. Right. So he, like, he, he recommends a certain kind of beatific, mystical silence, a sort of unknowing, right, albeit thought as unspeaking, right, uh, when it comes to what he takes to be the important things in the world. But interestingly enough, and this is where it's really famous, right, what he turns around and says is all of the propositions in this book all of these things I've been saying, all of these claims I've been making to make this argument, they make <coughs> sense. You'll say, you cannot describe the structure of intelligibility itself. You cannot picture the structure of language which enables us to use it to describe things. All you can do is show it. <coughs> What's between saying not original no, they were entirely influenced by him. Oh, right. they, they read this book and went, this is the best thing since sliced bread. Right. Um, so this is, but they, they, in a certain sense, misunderstood it, because they were completely opposed to mysticism. And Wittgenstein is totally a mystic, right? He's saying that there are these ways we can use language in order to talk about the things that we think are important to talk about, if only to talk about those things that we can and can't. Right? So what Wittgenstein <coughs> does is to draw the limits of thought right, by showing us the structure of intelligibility. And then when we get to the end, he tells us, everything I've just done is a ladder. When you've climbed up that ladder and you've gotten where you need to go, kick the ladder away. Right? And that's a kind of unknowing. That's taking a theology. Right. Catch you next week. <laughs>